Uh, hello, and uh, oh, you know me. Let's see. Um, we just have a from the University of Manchester, and today I'm going to tell about the modularity in the anthologies and the alternative position. So, what's the point of the day? <coughs> it's uh, <coughs> right. We'll have a look at the. Uh, Set of things for which I thought she had use. And uh, we see how the modularity might, might help between these tasks. Then we concentrate on the modules for the reuse of nations and show why the modules, how, how we find modules and uh, why is it done this way and how can we actually get modules. Then we'll look at the module structure of the anthology and uh, figure out how all of them can be presented in nice and short form. Then, if I would have time, I'll speak a bit about the application of automatic position and uh, we'll summarize the thing. <coughs> right, so if uh, we try to see how the analogy might be used, by, <coughs> by people who, who built it and who use it. So this is here. We want to use ontologies to represent and uh, to, to manage and keep the knowledge of a summoning area in a structured way. We might want to get some inference out of this knowledge and get new facts. This is like uh, in classification or in query answering, we might want to figure out why this or that inference holds, why, why we get this answer to the query, or why this analogy is consistent. So we need to uh, way to understand what's going on inside, and this is uh, for this one we use justifications, which is also one called thin point. Uh, yeah, there are plenty of ontologies around and you don't usually want to start building ontologies from scratch. You want to take some other ontologies and combine them knowledge, which is uh, <coughs> kept there together, into your ontology and the way how to do a proper reuse of these ontologies um, is also part of the things that introduce, ontology introduces to it. Uh, you might want to look a bit from a higher level of your knowledge and figure out how how this knowledge, which what are the forms in which this knowledge is represented. So, what are the structure of your ontology? What are the repetitive uh, elements or the patterns used in the ontology? Are they correlated to good patterns or bad patterns? And such a thing like ontology comprehension. Right, and the uh, for all of these tasks. The use of modules will, will help you. We'll definitely see a lot of how it helps in terms of ontology use. But uh, again, uh, it's easier to work with modularized ontologies that the modularized uh, structure than just a big block of something. And if we look uh, from that ontology as an artifact, which summary works. So what do we expect from the ontology? Okay, we want fast reasoning, so we don't want to get hours into do this <coughs> until the ontology will be classified or the query will be So um, right. So I should set up different things like okay, you need to get balance between the specific and the language you need to to work right on the ontology and the complexity you want to, uh, of which this uh, language required to, to, to make inferences. And different organizations, the incremental reasoning in which you don't need to request by the whole after <coughs> just a single answer. And so all, all these sort of things that helps using it to be faster. Uh, some other things like the, the collaborative development, if you're not a single person who works on ontology, 
the question is how you organize the world to, to put several people's changes into a single one. Version control and game comprehension, how the ecology looks. Uh, for all this stuff, uh, game modules, modularity helps to do things more efficiently or at least uh, to do more helps. Uh, yeah, more for some things, less for other things. But anyway, you can get that out of it. Right, so there are two possible paths of modularization, and they, are, they could be done separately, they could co coexist in a single ontology. So the a priori thing is when you start, when you think about ontology as a set of blocks from the very beginning and you develop it as it is. So you define the top level ontology, define the true top level ontology, and you uh, put a few others under it. So you develop it, it in the modern way from very beginning. We don't touch it uh, at the current talk, but we're more interested in the a posteriori modularization. So you have an ontology as a single thing, you either use it from where or you design it in some way suitable for you. And then uh, at some point when you start using it, you grab a module suitable for your work with this part of the ontology of the whole thing. So this is the apostolic modularization, this is how for it we this this is a goal kind of tell. Right, so uh models for use. Uh, how it come to modules? Okay, the, assume you do have a need to compare ontologies, right? You want, you're looking for a medical ontology for your application. And you come to the market and you see two different ontologies. So the question is how, how are you going to choose? Which, which one are you going to choose? So we're looking for criteria of compare ontologies. Right? <coughs> Probably, well, one possible answer is this. Okay, I prefer the one which contains more knowledge. Right? But which is sensible, right? You buy the knowledge base, the more knowledge is less, the better for you. And, uh, okay, but now the question is how are you going to measure uh, how much knowledge is the knowledge is. And, okay, you start thinking in terms of uh, so the things, right? What is the count number of axioms? The more axioms, the better. Why right, but Well, if you start looking at it, okay, we have A implies B, B implies A in one ontology, and A equivalent to B in the other ontology. Right, the first ontology has two axioms, so this is one, but the meaning is the same, right? So it's exactly the same. And it's going to be more fun. So if you have three axioms in the first ontology and a single one in the second ontology, actually the second one contains more knowledge than the first one because uh, axioms two and three are actually ontologies. So we have only implication into one direction in the first ontology and implication to both directions in the second ontology. So um, yeah, number of axioms is not very good. Again, it's, it's syntactic, so well, different representations might, might affect it very much, like in this case, in the first case. Right, so what else? Can, what can we check? <coughs> well, uh, probably the yeah, number of intelligence. So how many, how many new knowledge can we get out of a single ontology? Or number of models. Like how many, how much the ontology restricts uh, the world in the domain of that. But let's start from the evidence. Uh, so, yeah, if you look at the axioms in a forward chain rules, for example, like, like they're doing in uh, our 2RL uh, file. 
so we have a few axes and then apply rules to the things you can infer new effects. Like if A implies exists at B, which means it also implies exists at all. And know that exists at all implies C and D. And if something implies C and D, it implies C and it implies D. So we can infer out of this fragment that A is a subclass of D. So yeah, D subsumes A. Uh, right, so but, okay, we take this this small T box, right? And here is one inference, one tailment. We can either entail that A by C in a very similar manner. But how many tailments can T box have? So we have a T box with a, an axioms, right? How many tailments can we infer? Is it some constant? Like zero to is it linear to the side of a T box? Is it exponential? Is it infinitely many? Whatever you can give the sum, so the zero is not, not a good answer. But okay, any any guess how the number of entailment is limited with respect to the size of the T box? It is unlimited because have plenty of things to say, uh, plenty of ways to say the same thing in different manner. So if I have frame raised D, then we can add a disjunction, anything at this junction will still be the same. Actually, any, any more or less anything which uh, contains A and D in it, infinitely many ways to say the same thing. So, uh, and this is not a good measure, right? If every T box has infinitely many intelligence, then we could compare them. <coughs> so let's turn to the models. And if we now think of axioms in a tuple based, <coughs> in a tuple uh, way. So we try to get the model, and the axioms are restricts us. So we couldn't have an arbitrary model, we need to satisfy all the axioms. So, yeah, let's consider this small example. If uh, hand the sample self exists as a finger, which means that every model of our hand should uh, have an uh, edge to a point which is a finger, and uh, this edge should be uh, in a, a spot uh, interpretation. If we say that hand is a subclass of uh, exactly five uh, parts, which are fingers, which <coughs> this gets us to more restricted uh, models in which every instance of hand should have five edges, right? Everyone is leading to uh, their own fingers. So they is that they all different and there are no more than five. So now we can see that this description is more simple than this one. Because in this, in, in, a model for <coughs> the first axiom would, would have two, three, ten fingers connected to a single hand. But this, the second uh, example, just prohibits this. Okay, now similar question. How many models? Again, we have two boxes with an axioms and uh, how, how many models model have such a two boxes? What's the estimation? So, what's the model? Model that is a <coughs> non empty domain and uh, uh, In 
Vicente Magalhães. Right. So, if you remember the previous uh, on the play the previous talks, actually, right? You saw some inconsistent ontologies, right? Of the double method that works. Why I am checking whether the is consistent or not. And the consistent ontology doesn't have any proof, right? So, zero is a legitimate that answer to this. There are ontologies without any models. But, there is no other way. Because for every every ontology that, every model that fix the way we can interpret things that are not described in the, in the ontology that we have signature. So and having a single model means that we can extend it uh, in arbitrary ways. So there are two variants, zero models and so again this it seems like this didn't give us uh, Good measure to um, <coughs> to compare two ontologies. So what shall we do? <coughs> right. If we couldn't compare numbers, sizes of of the set of intelligence and new models, we can compare the conclusion. So we can say that okay, one ontology knows as much. Okay. Most as much as another one prior. Mm -hmm. If uh, every element uh, of one ontology is also an element for another, and similar to models, so if we have a set of models and elements of one ontology and another ontology, we can check the subset relationship between the two and the one which which is included into another one <coughs> is small processor, or less. Right, but now the, here's the problem. This sets up infinite, and the question is how we test this, how we test this uh, set of Okay, uh, let's look at this from a set of Terms you. So you again you come to the market with a having in mind <coughs> biomedical ontology, but you don't need to you come with a particular need. You you want to deal with diseases. Right? So you come and look which of the medical ontologies provided in the market gives you the best coverage of the diseases. Right. So you have to you say, okay, what can I give you for the disease? I think, okay, well, my ontology contains other things like medical, uh, personnel, medical uh, uh, machinery, and drugs, and diseases, and human anatomy. Say, stop, I need mean, normal diseases. How, well, what is the substance to give you? And again, now we need to compare not the whole ontologies, but just parts of the ontologies which describe the same area, the same area given by the signature. So, right, the one, the one which knows more about this is, okay. and what, what is the best subset with respect to this is? Uh, okay, we want. <coughs> A part of the ontology which knows as much of the diseases of a chosen area as the whole ontology itself. Right? We don't want to let something aside. We want all the knowledge from the ontology to be kept in our small part. Uh, in other words, the uh, module M is indistinguishable from the whole ontology uh, with respect to all the terms that are relevant to for diseases. So everything I could ask for diseases. <coughs> Uh, in the whole ontology. I should be able to ask for the small <coughs> part of the ontology and get the same answers. And we want them to be as small as possible. But we don't want to pay extra for something which we don't need. We'd like to, and again, small ontologies means it's, uh, it's recent 
more easily and it's uh, more understandable easily and all that, as long as it gives the same <coughs> amount of knowledge as the big one. Right. Okay, so uh, let's start from the signature. And the signature is actually just a set of named entities in the astrology, set of a concept or names and role names. And the, the signature of Axiom is the, all the names, named entities in this Axiom, and the signature of the ontology is just the, all, the, all the names that appears in the ontology. Okay, uh, and now to this interpretability thing. Two ontologies, or one and two, are sigma inseparable with respect to the logic. Uh, we do this skyway if uh, for every intelligent written in this language, description logic language L, uh, with its signature is in the sigma. We have uh, both ontologies which behave the same with respect to this intelligent. <coughs> so if one of them entails each other and another one should be and if one doesn't do the other, then another one does. So let's finish uh, this from a bit of worries. <laughs> and, uh, okay, is it? Any questions? Comment is fine. So we take two ontologies, right? We don't know about, not much about them. We pick a signature, a set of terms, and we pick a logic in which we are going to make our queries. And then we say that two ontologies are sigma inseparable. If uh, the same entailments, every entailment is written in the given language and in given signature, uh, is the same for, for two ontologies. So we couldn't distinguish one of the other. Right. And now the modules, having this in mind, the module definition is very simple. Module uh, of the ontology is a subset of ontology, uh, which is inseparable from it with respect to sigma and uh, query language. In the literature, you can also see names like uncovers all for sigma with respect to L and O oh, is a sigma dynamic extension of L with respect to L. So, uh, <coughs> yeah. Well, the first name is quite self-explanatory because um, yeah, M covers as much knowledge of sigma with respect to this as whole. And the second one is goes in the other direction and says, okay, if you have model M, fix a sigma and add axioms which didn't introduce anything new, then uh, okay, the, the, the two things could know the same. They, they contain the same amount of knowledge about the given area. Right, uh, some, yeah, how we're we going to, what can I say about sigma? We can think about sigma as, as a topic of the, uh, on which we are interested. So if we're looking at the, uh, yeah, in the middle of the name, yeah, right, we have a huge ontology. Think about diseases. You only think one, two of them. You can think, okay, right, this disease, so let's try to find a disease in my ontology. And the module require now to cover all the knowledge written down in this uh, in this signature. So any expression I could build up from the terms of the signature, uh, this module should should be able to answer in the same way the whole ontology is. And again, it's, it's quite easy to, to say whether it's enough to have a single, what, what, what can I say if you have just a single uh, term disease in, the, in your signature? How many things can you 
formulate an adjusted single term. Right. It's not that much. Right. It's you can't even use any properties here, right? Because you don't have any property names in this signature. But the question how to choose signature is not a good thing. Right, and now how are we choosing the language? Again, the language depends very much on uh, how you want to use your model, right? If you use it to query Right, and choose your query. If you if you're going to use the module to use in, in, in the ontology, then you want to figure out okay what's what's the language of your ontology because the, when you're going to uh, integrate some foreign module into your ontology, then you're going to use the uh, language of your ontology. This, with respect to this language, the uh, module should, should be uh, should use the same determinants. So again, this is depends on the usage scenario rather than uh, anything else. Okay, now to the topic of the uh, part. We want to use modules, so we take the ontology instead of importing all to our ones, we think of how uh, we, we, we set a signature, grab a module, and use this module in our ontology. The question is now is it fine uh, to, to have just, uh, just what we check from the module definition in order to satisfy our needs? Well, not really, because we're going to constrain more the uh, knowledge, the, the axioms which we grab from the foreign ontology. And as long as we're constraining it, we need to have the same <coughs> the same determinants for the model as the whole ontology. Here is a formal definition. So we need to be sure that whichever axioms we write in our ontology, if you use the foreign one, the Results, the determinants of the module will be the same as the determinants of the whole ontology, right? And independently of, of additional axioms. And is it, is it something which we get naturally? Is it something that we expect in any case? What do you think? So we take a part of foreign ontology, add something to it, and this is also the same as we take the whole ontology and some it. Given the signature, which we enter. Right? What do you think? Is, is it cold? <coughs> well, in this case, it's just too strong to be true. And a simple example is here. <coughs> So we have an ontology with two axioms, same size B and same size B star C. And the signature we are interested in is uh, given here in blue. So it's A, R, and C. And we, in the ontology, which in our own ontology, we have an additional axiom B implies C, right? So if we look at the original ontology, then the module for this signature the language LC, we we in this language, is uh, just the second axiom, right? Because the first axiom didn't have knowledge about uh, A and C, respect to all. But when we add in this small addition here, and this axiom, which previously was useless and ignored in the ontology, starts to play its role. Because the original ontology with, with this one gives us A implies C which is determined in terms where, in which we are interested, right? It contains both A and C. But we don't have this impairment in the module because having just this and this didn't give us the expected answer. So this is too general restriction. 
we couldn't expect that every addition to our module will be behaves the same as the addition to the whole ontology. Right, um, what shall we do? Okay, we, we can get this result if we somehow restrict the possible additions. So if we're going to use our ontology in a, in a proper way, namely if uh, the signature of this new ontology uh, is uh, part of it, which is Same with the original ontology. It's inside our set sigma, mm -hmm. which means we don't uh, change anything in O, which is outside the sigma. And if language is expressive enough, like O, then it's safe to do so. Then it's safe to uh, add anything which is in sigma but not outside of the sigma. So we can use M as a module to find this way for uh, for any if we didn't interact with the rest of the whole ontology outside of Sigma. Right. Any questions? How to how to create a module? Right. Okay. Um, let's let's try to do this very simple algorithm. Start from an empty empty set, and uh, oh, yes, yeah, from the whole ontology, and try to get rid of axioms one by one. And if we remove an axiom and the rest is equivalent to O with respect to L sigma, then okay, that's fine. Just throw it away. And if nothing else could be taken out <coughs> from that module without lifting, without losing the inseparability uh, relation, <coughs> but then okay, we're done. Couldn't get rid of anything else, so just get M as a module. So the problem now is uh, uh, okay, we, we don't put an order of which we are going to check ourselves. So different uh, different orders might lead to different modules. So I have this quite a lot of don't don't think it is too precise. So we have a six axioms, <coughs> seven. Six, that's right. Six axioms uh, from the uh, medical ontology, and sigma is two terms, me and Kim's join. And uh, so we'd like to find a minimal module with respect to assumption of for sigma. And one of them is contains four axioms. That's one, the last one. Last one. And one, two, four, and five. Uh, because, okay, let's go this way. Uh, so, we have a joint, we have a part of a teller, which is born in the moment. So, it's the left hand side here. <coughs> and uh, we have whatever it is, and then come, come here. So we have two a chain on both sides of which we have our elements from the signature, and oh, we done. We couldn't get rid of any, any element of this chain, but this chain would be broken and we lost uh, the subsumption in the hinge chain. Well, I don't think we have a subsumption in the other way, but at least this one is uh, in terms of this one. But, Okay, are there any other ways to do so? Uh, yeah, in this case, we just say that, okay, 
Here's this is two funerals, which is joined and this and that. This is natural point of fire. And this is the same thing with in conjunction with something else, so which is smaller than this. And again we can see this uh, element here. So this one is probably just three axioms, but these are different. So none of them is we can say that it's smaller than that. I have two different models which are minimal in the sense we couldn't remove anything of them. Uh, but uh, they are really different in comparable this way. So for probably such a simple example we could have different minimal models. Right? And again some some observation that if we do have a model it doesn't really necessarily mean that all the axioms that use terms from sigma go, oops, too much, go back. Right, I have an axiom here without any terms from sigma at all. Right, axiom number three. And again, the same axiom is not used, actually, no axiom only uses terms from sigma, right? All the axioms in this particular example will be some other terms as well. So this model thing really uh, forces us to keep the axioms which might affect reasoning in terms that we set to see. Right. But okay, in theory we have such a nice result, but actually it's the question is how we're going to check this inseparability. And for very simple logic like EL, it's uh, checking the inseparability is already exponential in size of a uh, problem. And it's even worse, it's double exponential, so it's two to the two to the n. crazy for slightly more expressive logics, and it's undecidable, so there is no way to decide the inseparability for the problems in the normal complicated language within the hour. So, and this is really bad, which means we couldn't use this nice and simple criteria to, to determine whether the ontology and its model are really uh, separable or not. Uh, okay, so. What shall we do now? There are three options, right? We can give up. And say, well, okay, so what shall we do? Let's just do the whole model. But it's, it's, I think, it's not an option because ontology grows quick and we just need to deal with more and more complex things. We couldn't really stay without modules. Uh, we can say, okay, but we know that for simple logics, the problem is uh, decidable and, well, it's complex, but still we reduce the complexity of our logic and restrict our cell, but still get some results. And here yeah, that's possible, but we're not going to talk about it much. Here we're more interested in the third way, saying, okay, we couldn't get the precise results, but we couldn't get uh, the exact minimal inseparable uh, module from the ontology. But could we somehow approximate this result? Could we have some thing which would be similar to module, which would be module but not the minimal one? And this is possible, yeah, and but we need to go to the right direction, right? We need to keep the inseparability, we need to cover the whole problem. We might get rid of minimality, we might get rid of but we don't want to give up the uh, set of inferences in which we are uh, the same as that we call ontology. So, uh, coming up the two approximations to, to this inseparability thing, one of which uh, based on semantic locality and internally on syntactic locality. So what is it all about? I'll skip the proof of how we get to it. 
but okay, we have a uh, O1 and O2 uh, sigma inseparable with respect to logic L. If for all the elements written in this language, with a signature in a sigma, uh, they behave, they both the tails and tails, or not the tails, this eta in the same time. And we can achieve this. Uh, this this is this holds that if uh, if uh, every up in a large ontology right, is semantically local with respect to the signature of the sigma and small ontology. So what semantically local means? We take an axiom, we take a signature, and we keep all the elements from the signature and we replace everything else with the bottom. Which means, okay, we we bother about the signature elements from uh, our sigma, and we need to have a model for them. But we don't really care about the rest. So let's assume that our model gives empty sets to these non-named entities. We, we don't want to know anything about it, so let's, let's keep them as simple as possible. Let's keep them bottoms. Empty interpretation. So, and if this axiom, after such a simplification in reduction, became an ontology, which, which means it doesn't restrict our model in any way, we say it's local. And it's local semantically because the check of the ontology is uh, uh, semantical precision, so it should be the ontology uh, Right. So, is it clear? Okay, any questions? Right. So, okay. We need to check the ontology, which means that we can just run a reasoning on our axiom and check whether uh, is it whether it's true or not for empty. Um, but it satisfies by the empty ontology or not. So that's how we check for the ontology. If it's, if it's satisfied for, for an empty ontology without restrictions, which means that yes, it's the ontology. So, but this means that it's the same complexity as a standard reasoning precision, which is for L to be low quite high as well. And we don't really want to, to do so, it's, it's just too expensive. Because if we need for every axiom check the uh, uh, it's, it's topology which is the same complexity as the reason in general, why not just take the whole ontology? We didn't put much here. So the next approximation is synthetic locality. So we just, it's very simple, we just look at that axiom and try to guess in which case it might become a ontology. Just, just look at the syntactic structure and taking you know, into account that all, all entities, named entities outside of sigma is our empty. So if we see a conjunction, right. Uh, If I have an axiom like C implies A and B and D, right? And C is in a signature of C, yeah. And B is, is in a signature. Right? A is not in a signature we are looking for. So it's immediately empty. It's, it's equivalent to bottom, right? And bottom conjunction with anything else is bottom as well. So this axiom is actually equivalent to C implies bottom. And C is from, from our signature. So this is something which is not trivial, so we we'll, we'll have to keep it. But if we go in the other way so like, uh, and C is not in signature, for example, right? then it immediately goes down to bottom and 
what implies something is always true. Right? So in this case, this is the tautology. So all the symmetric reality of algorithm does is just goes into expression and try to see whether after replacement of result it's possible to simplify it. And after all the simplifications are done, it checks whether the resulting axiom is the or not. Like, is it in the form that bottom implies some or something implies top? So, uh, both syntactic and semantic ecology gives us modules, yeah, which are inseparable from all, but not with just a given sigma, but with something larger signature. We need to take into account the signature of the module itself. And they are not necessarily meaningful. So we might put something in the module which is not which is not required to cover all the uh, all the intelligence. But uh, we just couldn't check it. This is a price for our approximation. So, <coughs> a couple of examples. Questions? Right, okay. If uh, we have an implication like everything there over, like over the name is something from a signature. So, in the first example, if I have something on the left hand side, uh, which is in our signature, then this is not, uh, this axiom is not focal because we restrict our B, our name B from a signature, with something, I don't know, it might be bottom, it might not be bottom, it might be, well, if it's not top, that's something, then we have to restrict our models uh, of B, and this means that it's not local. Okay, let's look at, the, at this example number two. So A implies B and exists as C, and both B and C are in our signature. But here we have things that R is not in our signature, right? So let's say we have to have bottom interpretation. Which means there are no two points in our model that are connected by a R. Which means this existential restriction couldn't be satisfied, right? We just couldn't find another point in our model which is R uh, related to the slide point. So this exists R C expression is again bottom. And then bottom and something else is bottom. So we come to the point. A implies bottom, right? Oh, right. yeah, that, that's the simple, simple, right? So this is bottom, but A is not in a signature, right? So A is bottom as well. So the whole axiom collapses into bottom implies bottom, which is true. So this, which is tautology, right? So it's it's not. Uh, again, to generalize this one, this case, if we have a name on the left hand side with conjunction to anything uh, which is not uh, in a signature. Then it's local again for the same reason. A is bottom, conjunction is bottom, bottom implies something if all is true. Right. Uh, on the left hand side, yeah, number four is what actually uh, so the bottom by, by similar explanation to here. So R is not a signature, it's empty. So this is sub C is bottom, bottom and B is bottom, and whatever R is, it is its tautology. So it's axiom is local. And here comes the bad thing, which is our price for the approximation. If we have an axiom like A implies A or B, which is tautology on its own, right? Uh, but uh, it's not local in our case for A and B <coughs> in a signature because we put an element there, or put, put a, take a take these two expressions there and say we couldn't say that they are we don't have a tautology, we have some complex axiom. 
So this action will stay in our module for A and B, even though it didn't give us any, any new knowledge about this. And it actually could even be replaced from the ontology and didn't affect any reason at all. But if we found the ontology, we would keep it for the module for A and B. So how are we going to extract module now? Right, we start from a, an empty module and try to check the axioms with respect to signature sigma and signature of the module for the quality. And if we find some non-local axiom in the ontology, then just add it to the module. So and we do so until, well, as long as the module will grow, this uh, signature might grow as well, of course, in most cases. So more and more actions became non local with respect to the signature and module grows, became larger and larger. So at some point, we, we stopped because we have a number of axioms in, in the ontology. So, and that's how we got the module in there. So, we know that it's sigma, it's this signature inseparable from the ontology because all other axioms are local, we couldn't change anything more. So this is what we are looking for. Right. Um, some relations to this uh, approach of getting modules. So when we replace every element not in a signature with bottom, uh, with this so such models are called bottom models. There is a dual way. You can replace the elements not in signature with the top, given the same okay. For the elements we don't care of um, the interpretation will be uh, just the whole domain. And in this case, uh, we call the modules top modules. And usually, bottom modules are much smaller than top modules. But we could do even better. We could uh, interleave top and bottom module extraction to the fixed point. So we take the bottom modules, then starting from the same signature, this module starting point, we apply the top module procedure to get the axioms, and do so until we stop. So in this case, modules are slightly smaller than bottom modules, but you have to do more computations. And this type of modules is called top-bottom star modules or just star modules. <coughs> right. So the atomic position thing. Right. So we learn how to take the ontology grab a module for this given given a signature. And <coughs> if you think about it, that you'll see that ontology can contain exponentially many modules. Actually, you don't know upfront, but every subset of the ontology would be a module potentially. And there are exponentially many subsets of the axioms in the ontology. Uh, another thing is that the modules are monotonic. Right? If some signature is a subset of another one, then module taken uh, by any algorithm from an ontology for this signature is uh, included in the module being taken for the larger signature. And again, it's, it's quite obvious, the more we want to know, the, the less and less things we could put down to bottoms, so the more axioms in general will be uh, necessary for us to keep some knowledge about the thing. So, some modules uh, in the ontology are included in ours. Do we have anything else? How, how modules are related to each other? Okay, if you look at the union of modules, we would call module a fake if, if it could be represented as a union of, of two comparable modules. So, if we have two modules, none of which is good into the other, and the union is the module itself, it's not necessarily true, it's not always true. 
But if you know of two modules gives us a module as well, we'll call this module fake. Because it contains some knowledge from a different domains. So it's module in the sense that there is a signature sigma for which it represents the whole ontology in the best way. But if you look at its structure, it consists, consists of a couple of independent modules. And so, I don't know what was the reason to choose the word fake, we can probably explain it better. Uh, the thing is, is that the, the, the idea behind the so-called fake module is that it doesn't capture anything inherently related between them. They're just two things that happen. You can take any two, roughly speaking, you take two modules and you slap them together, right? the right other conditions hold. If there's no interaction between the two parts, right, then the fact that this is a module is kind of uninteresting, right? It's not it's not a fundamental building block. It's just it's just something that happened to get slapped together. Um, that's the reason why it's a okay. and, there, and and there's there's going to be way more of these than there are the sort of genuine modules because you can just slap all sorts of ones together. And so you spend all your time looking through these other ones and they don't tell you a whole lot. In fact they're quite misleading as well. Okay, okay, so next to the name. So, yeah, as Jan already said, the module which is decomposable is such a thing. The building block for our modules in the ontology is a called a genuine module. And if you have a look, there is not. Yeah, well, first of all, any module is a union of one or more genuine modules, right? Because if you can decompose it, if it's fake, you can separate two things and these are building blocks for modern architecture. Large building blocks because they can intersect. And again, there's a theorem saying that every genuine module is a module for a signature of an axiom in the ontology. So if you take an axiom and build a module, you take an axiom, get a signature of this axiom, and build a module using one of our methods uh, for, for this signature. <coughs> and the model you will have to result will be genuine. It's not a union of anything. Right. So, which means that have much smaller modules, genuine modules are than all modules. So every genuine module is uh, corresponds to an axiom. Probably a few axioms could, could be in the same model. So not more than the number of genuine models is not larger than the size of the ontology. So, and we could actually look at how this genuine model is organized. And well, thanks to Kiara, we've got a nice animation option to show you. Something non-empty on the left hand side and something empty on the right hand side. 
So this axon is not local, and we have to put it into the into the model. And the rest is fine because well, we don't have wiggle on the left hand side anymore, and so everything else. For everything on the left hand side could be it's just uh, bottom, so all of them are also. Then, okay, this one again, okay, it's will be cool, we cool as part of it, right? So we have people here, we need to put a one. But for example, for here, board is not in a signature, so it's have a form bottom implies something and it's local. And the rest of the for the same reason. Right, let's go. <coughs> Here's something interesting. We have car wheel and engine. Right, then we have engine is not empty, so all this this action goes in. Then uh, uh, what else? Yeah. Here's car wheel on the left hand side. So it's non-local. This is non-local as well. And uh, and that's it. Actually, for, for this example, we only have to look at the left-hand side and see whether it's transmitting signature or not. So we continue doing this quite a bit module because the car is uh, on the left-hand side. Of just this, but still, we have wheels straight away, we have engine, we have vehicles, so we put quite a number of them. So this axiom is exactly the same model as the uh, so two axioms respond to the same model. And yeah, this is a small one, just a single axiom. So we do all the modules for all the axioms, right? And they Induce some structure. Right. We call see some of the atoms are participating many modules, some 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 of the atoms participating in very few modules, just like this in, in one module. But there are axioms that come together. So the atom is a maximal set of axioms that never split across two modules. Like these three. They sit in the same module over together, it's not before this one and the big one, and they don't participate all together in any other modules. So atom, this is set called atom because it's the smallest building block of the for the modules in the ontology. Right? It's, it might not be a module on its own, but it's, it's a building block for modules. Let's put it this way, for given ontology, we couldn't distinguish these axioms in terms of participation in module. And having these atoms around, we determine them by comparing modules for axioms. We can put dependencies between them. And dependency means that an atom depends on another one. If Whenever this atom appears in the module, this atom appears in this module as well. So if we go with back, right, this atom appears in, in just one module. But together with it, alpha six, four, six, seven, eight, and one appears as well. So. Atom alpha five depends on one. Right, and this event is getting drunk. So this structure is called an atomic decomposition model. Yeah. So now back to the presentation. Well, just the same thing in, in definitions. So, 
every genuine, every, every module itself, including genuine ones with a set of buttons, right? And the number of buttons is bounded by the number of genuine modules, so it's not more than the size of the right? Uh, uh, what are the relations between atoms? Atom depend, A depend on atom B, if every model that contains an atom A contains also B. So this atoms forms a dependency graph. And every atom with all the dependencies uh, forms a genuine model. Right? It's, it's quite easy to see. But remember that the module is something uh, which starts from an axiom and goes uh, takes uh, genuine model, model is a model for uh, atoms, uh, axiom signature. But every axiom is in the atom, so if you take the atom for the uh, for a given axiom, it would contain contain in, in, its, in its genuine model. Right? But also know that all the dependent atoms are in the same module as well. So all the atoms dependent, uh, that A depends on will be in the same module. So they all atoms forms their module for this axiom, so it's general. And all this structure is called composition. So to summarize this, there are a huge amount of modules in the ontology, right? Explanation many in general case. But most of them are fake. They can be viewed as a union of one or more uh, genuine modules. And genuine modules can intersect to each other, and this intersection is always a module as well. So we can split the set of genuine modules into the axioms which uh, appears in, this, in every model they are either all together or they are not, none of them is in the model. So this smallest little box called atoms. And these atoms have dependencies which are useful to find, uh, which provides a way to build a model from the atom. So this structure is called a different position. And well, what is it useful? <coughs> How can we use that component composition? So if every module is bad, there, we can quickly build new modules out of having this small structure. So if we have a proper labeling of the composition, what is the signature that leads us to, to this module? Uh, we can quickly build modules out of the, the small bricks. Yeah. So if we, you come to the ontology of the signature and try to ask for a model for this signature. In general case you need to do the long procedure of checking every axiom of full quality and it's quadratic uh, in size of the position. Which is not too bad, but still with a tonic composition in hands you can do that you can just map your signature into the labels of the uh, atoms and ground the atoms, ground all the dependent atoms and put them to take away. So, what are the other uses of the atomic composition and modularity in general? Right. Uh, so, if actually, as, as we saw at the beginning, the modularity is applicable to more or less every aspect of user ontology. And uh, the rule of thumb is. Uh, if you want to reuse the search space, if you need to, to, to search through the ontologies in some way, uh, then use modularity to reduce the search space while keeping the correctness of the reasoning. So I'll touch a few things that I implement already in tools, and there are definitely more applications, but uh, this is something that you can touch and play with right now. So it's uh, Start from the explanation sense. You probably saw it in the hands, hands on last session. So the thing is, um, in simple method project, right? Uh, given the intelligent, uh, let's try to understand why this intelligent holds. 
So if you have something called, so if you tell us that something is going to get a proof of as long as that, right? We don't want to look to all the uh, 600,000 of axons to figure out why, why, why that holds. We want to get the minimal subset, I call it the minimal amount of uh, axons which are the reason of this interpretation. This and uh, the explanation service justification service just gives you this. So you ask for, for the interment that holds in the ontology and it gives you the smallest possible fragment of the ontology, which, uh, which is a reason for it. So the interments are similar to modules in the sense that it gives you a it is a subset of them. And it it provides you an interment. Right. So it's, it's similar to modules in the way that the inferences are the same from, from this particular fragment of ontology. But the difference is it, it doesn't look to keep all the interments. Right? It just requires uh, to, to, for the particular interment to hold. So which means it might be smaller than one. You don't need to keep all the interments, so it's uh, might keep some like this up. And there are justifications which are called laconic, which in which you don't if, if a part of an axiom doesn't involve in the inference, so it's absent from the laconic justification. So it's the function level more fine grained than an axiom. That's the difference from the modules. The mod in the modules will work on the axioms and on the model. And okay, how the normality works here? Well, it's quite quite obvious actually, because you're looking for the subset which entails which preserves given entailment. Let's start from the model which preserves this entailment, and then figure out what can we take out of the module because we don't need to keep all the entailments there. So we start from a model which is much smaller than the whole ontology. Do this procedure pretty much similar to what we got for the module. So I will take axiom by axiom from the module and see whether the given interment is still holds. And if there is nothing to to be true, then we we'll find the justification for it. Right, so here is how the modularity helps in the explanation. Uh, now let's again probably a bit. Uh, Complicated, but uh, still okay. Incremental reasoning. When you push a classify button, the oh, listener behind the scene protege compiles the <coughs> hierarchy of classes and gives it to you. Then you change uh, add a new axiom into the ontology, right? And push a classify button again. And in traditional reasoners, all the results, all the classified things is thrown away and the whole classification goes away. Which is uh, a bit painful because we just change something small but need to put a, more, a lot of efforts in order to get the results back. So is it possible somehow to well to, to detect how which area this change affects and then reclassify with this small area? And well, yes, it's actually possible, and modules helps here. So in the processing step, the reason I just builds modules for all named classes in a signature. So the signature is a singleton, just a name of a class, and then you build a module for each of them. In some cases, the module is empty, which is which means that class is not restricted in any way. Ventology uh, doesn't restrict the uh, uh, interpretation of the class in any way. In some cases, it's non empty and contains some amount of axioms. Uh, but still, you, you keep this information uh, next to next the ontology. And when the ontology change, you take the changes that, uh, set, set of changes, which axioms were added, which axioms were. Uh, removed, and then you recalculate modules that affected it. So you know the signature of the changes, 
we just have a look at the model you've got and see which models are affected. And if what the so have a new set of models in the ontology. And then for every subsumption which involves uh, an element from a signature of the affected module, which means that it might be changed. Check the subsumption on a new ontology, not for the whole ontology, but for, for a new model, which falls. So it, it's all sound quite complicated, and uh, it's, it's really not very simple. But at least it's, it's possible to do, and if you've done so, it really helps to work with a, an uh, environment in which you work as an ontology engineer. You do some change, you classify, you do some change, you classify. And this, this pattern of ontology is really uh, affected by this. You can never use anything. And yeah, both Peloton and Sela are otherwise a ontology plugin. So you can try them and try to check the difference on some large ontology with a couple of changes, how the performance is affected. Especially if, if changes Random, like you have a new subsumption in BNC with no names being set here in the ontology. It's really a uh, very nice um, illustration to the principle of uh, Okay, modular reasoning in general. Right, there are two examples of this, and one of them is very recent work. Uh, I think it's, it's presented in this year. Uh, the deal workshop and it's going to present it this week as well. Um, it's uh, the model reasoner which is uh, done in the So it works on a simple observation, right? Uh, if you look at the ontology, it's mostly quite simple, right? I think uh, so something at least forty percent of the Axioms in the ontology are just trivial subsumption between the classes like A and like B. And if it's slightly more complicated, still it might fall into the AL uh, uh, file of the R. And we know that for AL there are tractable reasoners which can uh, classify the whole ontology like this. But we couldn't use it for few. Uh, axioms which are outside of an AL fragment. So this is metanoid. So the idea of the more reasoning is to to separate these two things. So let's take all the axioms which are outside the build of the AL fragment. Build a module for them, which covers all the information about the axioms which are not in the EL. Take these axioms out, which are hopeful not too much, and fit it to the general our DL reasoning, which is found in this case. And after the Hamid classifies this part, it takes the taxonomy of classes, so it has primitive subsumptions like A implies B, without even trying to be closer. Put it back to the original ontologies instead of these complex, complex axioms. And fit this EL the EL ontology to the L, which classifies it very, very quickly. And the result of the classification of this merged ontology is exactly as a result of the classification of the original one. So, but the benefit is that we need to classify complex part, uh, the, the part which is need to class be classified for the L DL reader usually much smaller than the original ontology. And the overhead is not that big. But the problem here is that this method works only for uh, classifications. We couldn't do yet arbitrary uh, intelligence using this way of reasoning. And here models modules are used to ensure the correctness of classification. So we take uh, we use enough information to get all the assumptions in the fragment we took away properly. We didn't lose any, any of the uh, assumptions, we didn't introduce any of the new automatic parts. That's why we use that. That's how one was the 
And another uh, reason there is a chainsaw, which is uh, made by us in Manchester. And this is a different approach, so it's completely modular one. Uh, it <coughs> starts from building an atomic decomposition for the whole ontology and use it for the fast module creation extraction from the thing. And for every query we are going to ask, it creates a module using this fast module decomposition and put this module to a delegate reasoner and then let this reasoner ask the query. And again, there are different modules, so they will, they will put them into different reasoners and keep a cache of 100 reasoners time to, to deal with queries that will come to us. And uh, some very little bit of details. Uh, use um, modules we build on the fly for the entire queries. So if you want to know if this is built of the concept or whether this action is covered by the ontology or something similar. You just take a, take a query, get a signature, build a module, you can into the cache and either give it to the reason or create a new module. Uh, it's a bit more complicated for the hierarchy queries because we don't know up front the signature of the answer. Right? If you ask, give me all the super um, concepts of this one, you don't know what, what is the signature of the answer, where to look at. But the good thing about this, uh, about the modules is that it's again, having an atomic decomposition, it's possible to label it in a way that you just do a single lookup of the atomic decomposition and you know <coughs> the module in which you are going to look for the superclass of the one. So we use this to, to answer, to, to, build, to classify the thing, actually. And again, caching really helps uh, here. So, and this is done because there are huge ontologies which we need to... Well, the reason I didn't be able to deal with them in a given memory limits, but after the splitting the ontology into modules and doing it one by one, uh, really uh, allows us to uh, deal with the ontology. And again, there are plenty of optimizations we plan to do, but right now it's just but still we're working on quite a lot. But another thing which can be much as clear by the student is a semantic diff and some other different things. So if I have two similar ontologies, right, or two versions of the same ontology, we'd like to know what are the differences between the two. Right? So how we can define a set of differences on, on the axon level, right? And for this, we use a model instruction to figure out the effective term. And then we classify those differences on a semantic level. Like, okay, is it gives us new intelligence or reduce the number of intelligence we've got or something else? Uh, and to figure it out which, which type of this changes, how this changes affect the thing. We have justifications. So, and for this, again, modularity is used. And it does quite a number of nice things. And if you have a look into our, our page, check it. Then we feel free to, to try it. Right, so finally, yeah. um, what did we learn now? So, uh, the notion of inseparability in the ontologies, right, and coverage in the sense that we know the particular area of knowledge which is presented in the ontology, uh, is a guarantee, gives us a guarantee which is relevant for the use of ontologies, but not only for this, to something else as well. Intelligence. And uh, okay, we learned that the exactly exactly thing is possible for simple logic, but quite expensive for them as well. 
and for more complex logics like L2, it can be approximated via a locality. Semantic locality involves reasoners, reasoning, but syntactic locality is approximation of an approximation. Doesn't involve a completely syntactic um, procedure or remember the syntactic side of the topology. And uh, these models can be uh, effectively instructed for the game for the complexity uh, out of the all two ontologies. And actually, well, comparing the synthetic and semantic locality things, we did some experiments very recently and presented them this year and going to write a paper later this year. Uh, we tried to implement the semantic locality. It's the first implementation of semantic locality ever. Uh, in fact, plus plus and compare the results of model extraction on a set of conscious ontologies. And only very few of them, like six or seven differs. And this differs mainly, well, there are two reasons. One is because there are ontologies in the, in the ontologies which uh, are in a form where synthetic locality couldn't uh, check it, but semantic locality grabs it. And another is quite complex uh, interaction between different constructors with the same expression, which uh, syntactically is non trivial, so it's kept, but semantically it's equivalent to what. So, and again, out of the hundreds of projects, I think only seven of them were affected by this difference. And in the end, uh, the rest was just completely similar with respect to semantic and semantic. So this is quite good approximation there. Okay, atomic decomposition is a compact representation of all the modules in the ontology and it gives us a way to quickly create modules and much more like this, with this determine the set of uh, concepts which are super classes of doing that. <coughs> well while while this area of description logics is quite new and uh, so many many questions are open or at least half open. But still there are already a few tools around and it definitely will be more in the recent future. So just look pretty easy. Alright, that's it. Questions? Okay then. <laughs>